So hello to everybody. Uh, I see some familiar names on the on the screen because several of the pe people from Claudius are on. And of course, I've been uh, specifically advising Claudius.ai so far. But uh, nice to see everybody else. Um, as Stephanie said, I currently have my own sales consultancy called Thimble Peak Advisors, but I've been doing sales in startups and in large companies for the last 20 or so years of my business career. And the Keller Center is kind enough to let me share some of the things that I've learned over that period of time with all of you. So before we get started, just a couple of comments. First of all, the slides will be available afterwards. So don't worry about taking notes. They're also, as you'll see, the slides are typically much more wordy and dense than I would give if I were delivering a customer facing presentation. That's by design so that they will, they will serve as leave behind. So you, you should have all the information afterwards. Uh, the reason I wanna do that is because I want this to be as interactive of a discussion as, as possible. And hopefully we can accomplish that over this Zoom medium. The other introductory comment I'll make is that I reviewed all of the different uh, backgrounders for the startups that, that you all have founded. And it seems like we have a nice mix of business to consumer and business to business startup. So typically when people speak of sales or think about sales, we in the business world think of what we call enterprise sales, which is B2B. But uh, I will try to make this as relevant to the business to consumer ventures that you've started as possible because de depending on your go-to-market strategy and a lot of the, it seems like a lot of you are still formulating your go-to-market strategy, there will be some selling involved even for business to consumer plays as you start to rely on distribution partners, whether it's the shippers for the company, I think it's Maname, that's, that's working on a shipping platform for Africa. You're gonna to have to sell to the shippers that become part of your network. And for, uh, let's see, is it Kotame, the other, uh, the clothing manufacturer, I know your business model is going to be an online distribution, but if you go to brick and mortar distribution at some point, the selling that you'll need to do is actually to the brick and mortar retailers. And so you'll have to use many of these same techniques that I'm going to talk about today in convincing them to carry your line of product rather than a competing line or something else. So hopefully this will be as relevant as possible to all of you, and again, I really wanna make this as interactive as possible. So please use the chat window and the combination of Stephanie, Gina, and Amanda will be monitoring chats and they'll stop me and ask the question on your behalf. And at the end, we'll, we should have some time for question and answer. I think that's all the housekeeping. So Stephanie, if you've made me the host, then I should be able to share my screen and I will do that right now. And let me just move the window of everybody's images so that I can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so we'll go into presentation mode here. Can everyone see the title slide? Excellent. So today's conversation is gonna be go to market 101 for entrepreneurs or what every founder should know about sales and marketing. Oops, I can't even see my title screen, so I have to make my window smaller. All right, so um, I'm going to give you a combination of startup learnings from my career and also sales learnings. I thought I'd start with a summary of, of thoughts I'm working at or even founding a startup, just to put this all in perspective and to encourage you all to continue to do what you're doing now, which is to actually take your ideas, your concepts for a company, and create a company. So let me get my animation working, there we go. So first things first, I'm not an entrepreneur or a founder myself. I don't think of myself that way. I absolutely think of myself as a startup executive. So there is a difference. I've never founded a company, actually until my little uh, sales consultancy now, but I've worked in multiple startups. And although I've also worked in big companies, my strong preference is startups. It's just a more exciting and challenging way to earn a living 
and to make a difference in your career. So whether you all go on to found companies or co-found companies or work at, uh, at smaller startups, you know, you will find this an incredibly rewarding career path. It's not the only one. You can always choose to go work for large companies. And I've done both in my career. In fact, I've oscillated back and forth. But now that I have the luxury of picking and choosing what I want to do, I am, I will never work for a large company again. And I very much enjoy doing what we're doing today, which is advising and even having a hands-on role at, start, at small companies. You all know that, no, that not all startups succeed and that's why it's called venture capital. But just keep in mind, even though the journey will feel difficult, it'll be difficult for all the right reasons and you will find yourself in the most rewarding growth-oriented periods of your professional career when you join startups. You've heard this, I'm sure, before from Professor Shao, but founders and leadership teams matter. And for all of you, you've probably worked through why you're working together, but the more cohesion and the more um, alignment you can have as a founding team, the more successful you will be. So given that you're on, on this path, I know you already have the passion for the, the space and for whatever the mission is that uh, your company is gonna uh, serve, but also focus on the fact that you will be leading the company. And one of the things that I've seen, especially with younger inexperienced founders, is that they aren't as conscious of their role as leaders and co-founders. And so I wanna just have you from the very beginning recognize your role as leaders of the companies and as leaders of people that will follow you and trust you with their own career decisions. So lead with strong intention and be humble because you're, especially for you all starting companies as early in your careers as you're doing, you won't have seen all the situations that you'll encounter and you'll be learning on the job as well. And that's where humility is gonna play an important role, but never forget your role as a leader. Product market fit and timing in the market matter tremendously. I've worked for companies that have had a great product, but the market just wasn't there or we just we were too early and the the overall need for the product or service that we were selling just wasn't developed enough so don't be discouraged by that but just make sure that you look objectively at getting your product to fit to a need in the market and recognizing that timing plays a role you all should know what you want from the experience of starting a company so make sure you set your expectations appropriately and reassess them constantly and objectively. You, you will find, because you're founders, that you'll have the tendency to go all in, and not just the tendency, you have to go all in on your companies. But you also have to remain objective about um, things like product market fit, timing, and other things like that. The bottom line advice I would give you all before we get started is pursue a risky venture at least once in your career, right? And you're already doing this, and so that's why you should be very excited. I've given this as, this is a slide from some, uh, from a career workshop I've done at other schools, but um, you know, I'll commend you for already having in your sights starting a, a, a potentially risky business, but everyone should do this once, and you may find that this is how you get your, your most satisfying business experience, right? Take a role, or found a company that builds your own skills, stretches your comfort zone, and most importantly, sounds fun. And you guys are leaders of your company, so make sure that you take the, the responsibility to create a fun and rewarding company culture very seriously. And of course, you're gonna go all in, but always be assessing at every point in your company's life, you know, the viability and be objective. Don't let this cloud your passion, but it is important to, when you're all in, still have an objective assessment of the company, the market, and even your own skills. My own startup experience, just to set context for where I'm gonna be sharing all this, uh, or where all the information that I'm sharing comes from. I think I've done a total, I, I think there's six startups listed. The first startup I ever did was back when I was fresh out of business school. And I was actually in manufacturing and supply chain back then. And I worked for a company called Echelon. 
Uh, I like to call it the original gangster smart devices and Internet of Things company because we were creating a, a network protocol and our product was a semiconductor chip that allowed us to create what has now become commonplace, smart devices, things like smart light bulbs and smart refrigerators and all these different devices that could actually be controlled via the internet. It was an idea that was very early, but Echelon's one of the two companies I've worked for that went public, we had a successful IPO, and that was where the down payment on my first house in Palo Alto came. So, um, you know, it was, a, it was a great experience. It was also one of the two companies that I've worked for that has had just an extraordinary leadership team. And that's why I go back to that comment before about leadership and founding expertise really matters. I worked for a company called Vivicon, software company. This is the first time I worked in sales. And our product was a supply chain resiliency software application. Um, Vivicon did not succeed, but I did find this screenshot of the software that we used to demo on the internet. So that was my second startup. My third startup a company called Harvest Mark, we did, it was an ag tech company and we did fresh produce traceability solutions. Uh, this was my first executive role in a startup and my, you know, I was running sales for the company. This was our product. See that little barcode on the watermelon? That watermelon, along with our technology, you could use your smartphone and scan and you could figure out exactly where that watermelon was grown, where, what day it was harvested, um, how long it had been in transit in the, the fresh produce supply chain from the original field, probably down in Mexico somewhere, Sunworld was, um, was uh, down in the border of Mexico and the US. Um, we had all this information. It was really a wonderful solution targeted at retailers and consumers, but we were just too early. So that company also didn't succeed. Then I worked for a company called Cloudera, which in fact does still exist today. And that was the second company that I worked for that went public. I was employee number 120 there, and now they're about 2000. Um, they're in the big data space and I've done another lecture on my experiences there. Again, that was the second company that uh, went public. So my second successful IPO, they also had just an extraordinarily talented leadership team. So, you know, my two IPOs were all led by experienced serial entrepreneurs. Doesn't mean that any of you that are starting your first company won't also be successful, but um, as you build your founder team, just recognize the importance of skills and be open to hiring people that maybe have more senior experience than yourselves to bring that expertise and that um, long experience of business knowledge into your company. <clears throat> for the last year of 2019, I ran sales globally for AvidBots, which is a company, uh, it's a robotics company in Canada. And this was our product. It's literally an autonomous floor cleaning robot. And I had the opportunity to travel all over the world, world to build a global sales team and to lay down a lot of the business processes that you need to be a successful and high growth sales organization. And then currently in my consulting capacity, I'm serving as basically the first business hire for two different startups right now. I'm doing both on a part-time basis because they're too young to need a full-time sales leader. One's in the natural language analytics space and the other one is in uh, the cloud DevOps space. And again, I'm running all business development and all early stage sales activities for both of those startups. So any questions about my background before we go? All right. So the way I conceptualize going to market for a startup, I, I want you to think of this in three phases. In the first phase of your company's life, you, the founders, will be the people selling your good or service. So you're going to spend all the time figuring out what your sales process is, what the customer's buying process is. You're going to be struggling with product market fit during this phase. You're going to be doing what you've heard many times. You're going to be pivoting. But you're going to be the ones doing the customer facing sales work and go to market work until you start to lock in on that elusive product market fit, start to gain momentum, gain traction with customers and start to have 
a much more repeatable sales process. At that point, which I call fails phase two, you'll hire your first sales resource that'll be a dedicated resource towards selling and going to market. And so at that point in your company's life, <clears throat> you'll need, again, a repeatable sales process and a repeatable buying process so that someone other than you founders, someone who doesn't have the market expertise, the background in the space, the kind of the first year or two of experience that your company will get, you're going to have to hire someone from the outside, but they're going to have to be able to do what you've been doing in phase one. So really important to look for patterns and establish as much repeatability as process so that that new person coming in can just focus on the selling. But you're going to have to focus on the sales management during this phase two, because you'll bring someone else to hire sales, but you, even though you've never managed a sales team before, you're going to have to manage that person and you're going to have to be, or that resource, I should say, and you're, you're going to have to uh, be thinking about sales from a process perspective. Then finally, you'll get to phase three, where you'll bring on your first sales leader. And this will be probably after you have two to three individual contributor salespeople. And then that sales leader will further add the processes and the repeatability that will allow your company to scale sales. Today, we're going to focus specifically on phase one. And that's why I'm going to spend this time uh, giving you the beginning education for the kinds of tools and techniques that you, the founders, will need for this phase one, because that's where you're going to be for the next, you know, who knows how long it takes for you to establish product market fit and momentum. So we ready to go? All right. This is what phase looks like. Phase one looks like rather. So you, the founders, are also the chief salespeople you're going to be responsible for closing your first customers and for making them successful. So it's both the sales and the delivery of your product or service that you, the founders are going to have to do while you're building your company, while you're hiring people to, if you're in technology to do the engineering and the marketing and the human resources, and you're going to be out raising money, but you're still the ones that are going to be, closing customers and making sure that as they, as your early customers use your product, that they are wildly successful because that is the most important part of laying a foundation for growth, making your early customers successful and figuring out what about your product needs to change or evolve so that you can continue to make more and more customers successful more easily. So as part of selling, you're gonna to have to develop all of the sales artifacts yourselves. I'll talk about what sales artifacts means in a slide, but think of it as the presentations, the pricing models, the demos, the prototypes. You're gonna do all of the things, all, all of the artifacts that are required to persuade your early customers to, to do business with you. You're gonna to have to create those yourselves over time you'll then start hiring resources who have more specialized skills. But in the beginning, you're the ones that are going to write the presentations and everything else. You're also, as you're figuring out how to sell, you're going to have to figure out for your target market, what is the buying process of your customers, of your tar target customers, right? So this, this might sound difficult, and it is, because buying processes are, are very different. You know, if you're selling into a healthcare space, that'll be one set of, one, you know, type of buying process. If your product is more targeted towards governments or nonprofits, that's going to be a whole different buying process. You got to figure out what that is, and you have to match your selling process to the manner in which your customers evaluate and buy goods and services like yours. So focus not just on trying to separate customers from their money. Think carefully about how they go about evaluating whether or not they're going to spend money on anything and make sure you gear your process for selling to them around what they need to buy. And the goals at the bottom are, are just what I said, right? Making your sales process match the buyer process and making it as repeatable as possible so that accelerates it accelerates your customers 
experience being successful with your product and buying more of it. And that's where scale comes in. Any questions about how I define this first phase and the types of uh, kind of design goals that, that you should have in mind as you're selling? Any questions so far? Stephanie, Gina, we get many? No, nope, no questions yet. Okay, come on, I want you guys to be a little bit more interactive than this. All right, what are these things? Before you can even start to quote sell, what are the things that you should have or that you'll need to, to give yourself the most likelihood of having people buy what you're selling? Well, these are the go-to-market inputs. We've talked about product market fit. I'm sure Professor Shao has entire classes dedicated to that. Uh, by the way, uh, Ed, if there are topics, that this, this is where we'll start to get into a little bit of what we would think of as business jargon, terms that might not be familiar with uh, uh, to students. So uh, let me know if any of these um, terms need more definition, and I'll pause and just explain. You're doing great so far, Todd. Thank Keep you. It up. Okay. So the other thing you got to think about, and this is actually what I'm doing right now for my two uh, consulting clients. I'm helping them with market segmentation. I'm helping them identify specifically who are the highest probability companies that will buy their products. I'm targeting the industries, targeting the companies. I'm helping them to define what we call the ICP or the ideal customer profile. Then you go even further, by the way, and you help within the ideal customer profile, you got to figure out what companies match that profile and you got to figure out what buyer personas inside a company are the people that make the decisions about whether or not to buy products like yours. So there's all of this thinking, and this is kind of early stage, a combination of marketing and sales work, but you all are going to have to do this because if you don't know, you know, what segments, what industries, what's the profile of the customer that you're going to sell to, then you're just going to be using a scattershot kind of a shotgun approach to going out and trying to find your first customers. You're much better off defining these attributes really thoughtfully and then using a rifle to go after only the companies early on that really are likely to buy. Todd, if I can interrupt uh, just quickly for a clarifying question. Uh, sure. We have a question that came in, uh, what is market segmentation? So market segmentation is it's again you'll you'll learn it in marketing classes in business school, but it's about understanding the nuances or kind of slice. If if you're a product, let's see, let me think back to um, here. I'll I'll give you a real example. Uh, baseline health, right? You guys from Baseline Health are going to be selling into healthcare. Are you going to be selling to large HMOs? Are you going to be selling to small community clinics? Are you going to be selling to the insurance companies? Are you going to be selling to the care providers themselves? All of those different companies form different sub-segments within the industry called healthcare, right? So segmentation means going deeper and really understanding what are the industries, what are the markets that have the business problem that your solution solves? And then figure it's, it's kind of a micro targeting exercise that helps you to figure out, you know, where specifically you should focus your prospecting and selling efforts because the value proposition of your solution will resonate more with one small segment of the market than it would with another segment of the market. This is also where you do things like come up with your total addressable market, uh, the, the, the TAM calculations and other things like that, that, um, that sources of seed funding and venture capital uh, funding will want to understand. So market segmentation is a broad term that really means knowing your market very intimately and knowing it very specifically so that you can both direct your selling efforts and frankly direct your product efforts towards filling a very well-defined business need. Otherwise, you'll be too general and you won't be as likely to, to really resonate with customers, right? Hopefully that answers the question. Any other questions? 
Yeah, there are two more. Um, the first one is what is TAM or TAM? Total addressable market. Basically, if you were to get 100% adoption within your target market, what is the total? It's kind of the upper bound, the theoretical upper limit for how much, uh, how big is the market that your product or solution could possibly satisfy, right? If you, if you have a clothing line, so I'll, I'll use a, an example from Katami. If you're designing a clothing line for 49 year old men that live in Sunnyvale, California, and that you know have this demographic and that demographic, the total addressable market, because your market is so narrowly focused, is gonna be relatively small. If you're designing a clothing line for you know, men in the 40 to 55 range that have this particular lifestyle, your total addressable market, your TAM, will be much larger. But, you know, so, so it's just a statement of um, kind of the maximum market size. Uh, the next question is, how can you find the people who make the financial decisions for a company you're trying to sell to? <laughs> that is one of the biggest challenges of sales. So there's lots of, um, of tools. Once you've defined who are the people, what is the kind of the role, what are the, the, the likely titles for the people that make the types of buying decisions that you're trying to get to, um, then there's a lot of uh, what's called MarTech or um, marketing technology. There's a lot of software products that have been created over the years, the last decade in particular, to help you discover how to reach the people that you've defined as your, your buyer personas. And so I'll give you an example. One product that's pretty well known in the market is something called discover.org. Um, it was bought by another company recently, I can't recall. Um, Oh yeah, yeah, it was bought by Zoom Info. Um, but there's lots of products out there that help you to get name, address, email address, phone number, contact info once you've figured out who it is that you're trying to reach, right? Sale, LinkedIn has a product called Sales Navigator that, that does similar things. In fact, I'm about to buy a subscription to Sales Navigator because one of my startups uh, clients, we, we need to be doing this ourselves. So. Um, but it's typically, it's, it, there are software packages that will do this for you. Okay. And again, by the way, if any, if any of these topics, uh, you guys want to follow up on separately, uh, you'll have my contact information and I'd be happy to have a, an offline conversation with any one of the other startups that I'm not formally advising to answer questions like that. All right. Okay. So we'll keep going. So. Go-to-market inputs include your commercial models, right? How you're going to price your product. What are the contracts that you need to be preparing? I told you about sales artifacts. Uh, you're going to need to develop the presentation materials, the white papers, the use cases, the return on investment, financial models. All of these things are sales artifacts that you will use to help your prospective customers quantify, oh, well, First of all, to understand and recognize that they have a problem that you can solve, because that's not going to be obvious to all of them, right? They might not know that they're the or or understand the impact of the issues inside their company that your solution can address. So you got to help them to understand that they have issues you can solve and the issues have business value if they solve them. So these are all the types of things that you'll need to develop as the founders. You'll also need to have a strategy for how you work within the ecosystem of the industry that you're targeting to maximize your momentum and influence. So this is probably a new concept, but you know, we go back to uh, the. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's do let's do a different one. Let's talk about um, Claudius. Right? What's the ecosystem? Their product goes is targeted towards personal injury law firms, right? There's a lot of other companies that are selling to personal injury law firms, right? Those companies buy technology, or those law firms buy technology. So you're gonna look for the technology resellers, 
they're called bars and, and bads and things like that, that are selling to the same target companies that you are. And you want to form relationships with those partners or with those other companies to make them part of your partner network, because that just expands the reach of your sales activities. And it also will, for the people that, for those buyers, the people inside law firms that you're trying to influence, you would love it if there are other people having conversations with those exact same buyer personas and mentioning your company or emphasizing your selling messages. So having an ecosystem strategy is far better than just thinking you're gonna go it alone and do all the selling yourself. You want the ecosystem to be selling with you and for you. And you have to do that very intentionally. And we'll talk a little bit more about outbound campaigns, which is really generating demand, generating awareness in the market for your product and generating demand as well. And then finally, the sales process, you know, the sales management 101 is all about having a good plan for your entire sales territory, identifying which of the companies or prospects are most important and most likely to succeed, and then having a really solid account strategy for those individual accounts or companies, and then having what I call deal plans or engagement plans for specific deals within the companies that you've targeted. So these are all the things that you should be thinking about as you're starting the sales process, because this will help you to improve your sales process and make it more repeatable so that you get more consistent and positive results. Any questions on this? Um, yeah, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah, so I, I'm curious to know, do these processes apply to companies that are not directly involved within the B2B uh, space? Uh, my answer is most definitely, but you'll have to adapt them. Serge, which company are you, or which uh, startup are you uh, associated with? Uh, Maname. Maname, okay. So the, so the example I would use for you is the need is clearly the consumer need for shippers. Your company, as I understood it from the brief, isn't proposing to be a new shipper for Africa, but a platform for existing shippers to make it easier for them to deliver to the target customers. Have I stated that correctly? Uh, yes. Okay. So at the end of the day, your business model relies upon your ability to persuade or convince the existing shippers, the DHLs of the world, if you will, that using your platform and serving your cus the customers that you're enabling is good business sense for them. Today, they're not serving that market well. You're gonna go and you're gonna argue, look, by using our platform, we can help you make more shipments and do so profitably. You're gonna need all of these artifacts. You're gonna need the, all of these commercial models. You're gonna need to understand who is your ideal customer profile. And you're gonna need to have an ecosystem strategy because you're gonna be selling not to end customers, but you're gonna be selling to shippers, convincing them to use your platform, right? Um, so eventually that's what we're trying to do, but like at the very beginning, we're actually creating a marketplace for like transporters to use. So, which is like, yeah, it's like, think of it like as the Uber of like transporting goods. No, no, absolutely. Uh, I, I got it. Yeah, yeah. It's just that yeah. you're, you know, you can do all the advertising that you, um, that you want, and that'll be a port, an important part of your business to, to create mm. awareness. But the transporters aren't, aren't going to choose to use your platform unless they see it in their business interests to do so. And for you to be able to persuade them that it's in their business interests to do so, you're gonna to need to do a lot of what we're just talking about right here. Oh, perfect. Make sense? Thank you. Yeah, it does make sense. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, so um, early stage companies are focused so much on product and on that product market fit. Uh, I have seen that 
the commercial considerations, the go-to-market tends to be to take a lower priority. And reading through the, the briefings of all of your companies, I think you guys are fitting this pattern, which is fine, right? You've got to start with the product or the good or the service. But you also should be thinking early on about the business model and wrestling with how you're going to charge your customers. How you, yeah, this, These are very technology-oriented uh, sub-bullets here. You know, in a software world, you're gonna the, the the software business model that has emerged is this subscription model, which relies on annual recurring revenue to to build and uh, build momentum for your market. So these are these terms again; they're very kind of software industry specific. But you'll have to think about whatever is the business model that applies to each one of your startups. And like I say. While you're focusing on building your product or engineering your platform or things like that, don't forget to be thinking about the business side. And as you're coming up with these early stage ideas for what your business model will be, going out and testing them as early as you can with prospective customers and trusted contacts to see if you have the right business model for the market segment that you're going after. You also have to think about how you structure your Go to market team in the say in a pure sales question, you're going to have to decide if you're going to rely on a direct sales organization long term, if you're going to rely on a partner or a channel sales organization structure. Many companies go with a hybrid, you know, you have to think through all those things early on. This is the question of who's going to sell your product and then demand generation, how you're going to create demand for your product. And then I've already talked about the ecosystem. So these are the commercial considerations that the sooner you can start to think about them and come up with ideas and strategies that you can go test with your earliest conversations. As you're talking to companies about your product and trying to establish product market fit, also validate the business models and the go-to-market strategies with them so that, so that you can get quickly to the models that work for your buying prospects. Okay, uh, any questions on that before we go? Because we're about to get to the actual sales part. All right, let's just baseline on what, what is the typical sales process? I've laid out in general terms, the different stages that you each should think about when you're designing a sales process. So let's just walk through these a little uh, quickly. I'll give a definition of each one of these steps. And again, you'll have to apply this to your particular business. You'll, you know, if it's business to consumer, then think about what are the, who is it that you're trying to um, sell to and how you apply this type of structure to your particular customer and their buying process, all right? In the beginning though, you gotta generate demand for your product, which means generating awareness in your target markets. And then, you know, awareness of the problem or of the need, and then generating awareness that there's a solution out there that solves that need, right? So, um, you know, for Crumpet Society, this, you would think of this as advertising which is correct, right? But advertising is in a, the most generic definition, still making people aware that they have a need and then making them aware that you can solve that need. So, you know, advertising for Crumpet Society, I mean, pretty straightforward. Look, everyone needs to eat breakfast. There's a new breakfast option out there and it's going to satisfy what you want out of your breakfast better than a donut from Dunkin' Donuts or a bagel from a bagel shop, right? But it's all about, so, so that's a business to consumer example, but you have to do the same thing in business to business, right? Um, you know, Claudius has to go out and generate awareness of the problem that all the personal injury law firms face, which is how do they, uh, how do they assess the likely legal outcomes of a potential case and, and how do they correctly assess whether this case is worth 
they're taking it on the client or not based on what they expect the outcome to be. You know, every, every personal injury law firm faces that challenge, but they may not be thinking about it as, oh God, this is a problem that if I had a technology solution, I could solve. They may just be thinking about it as, you know what, this is just what our business does, right? It's, we just, we're personal injury lawyers and everybody has to, um, we, we have to make an assessment every time a client walks in the door. You have to help them to understand, wait, that's actually a solvable problem versus just, yeah, this is just a challenge in our industry. That's what demand generation and then prospecting is designed to do. So prospecting is after you've been creating this awareness in the market of both the problem and of the solution to the problem that you have, then you want to be going out and in a targeted fashion, reaching out to you know, the target accounts, the target customers that are most likely to have the problem and to need the solution and to, to ultimately want to buy. So that's the prospecting stage, right? You can imagine that in the old days, it was just about a boiler room of people picking up the phone and making phone calls. Nowadays, there's so many more sophisticated solutions for sending out emails, following up with phone calls. You can monitor when people open your emails. You can monitor when they read the attachments. You can monitor when they forward your notes in inside their company, right? There's all sorts of really amazing uh, marketing technology or MarTech that allows you to do a much more targeted job of prospecting and to know when a customer or a prospect is ready to engage with you. That used to be really hard, right? It was a hit or miss process when all you had was the phone and you just call. Nowadays, you know, I use this software myself. I know when people read, when they open, when they reopen um, my emails. And if I can see that they're, they've opened my email three times today, you know what, I'm gonna send them a follow-up because I know that, that, my, that my email is on their mind. And then they get this, this follow-up email and they're like, oh, that's funny. I was just thinking about Todd and here he is sending me another email. How cool, I'll, I'll respond now. That didn't happen by accident, right? <laughs> that was very intentional. And I know it sounds like big brother kind of stuff, but this is how prospecting is done today. So don't be afraid of using this stuff. In fact, you need to be using this stuff early on because it's gonna make you more, more efficient and increase your chance of success. Let me just pause on that, right? You guys, that all makes sense to you? All right, we'll keep going then. Once you've gotten the customer to engage, you, invo you engage with them and you do what's called, whoops, sorry. You do what's called discovery. This is about first and foremost, understanding and validating what matters to the customer, validating that they have the business problem that you can solve, validating that they have the capacity to buy what you are hoping to sell them. It's understanding everything about them so that you know that they're a, a legitimate candidate for your product. And then this qualification step, which literally happens at the same time, is knowing that it, what matters to you, to your company, is also correct, which is you're not gonna waste your time selling to this prospect because they fit what your criteria is, uh, they have a need and they have an urgency to, to do something about that need now. That's what matters to you, but they're not gonna buy anything if it doesn't satisfy a, a, a problem that they have. And so you're validating in your discovery process, you're qualifying them as well, that they are that, that they're at least a likely prospect that'll buy your product. Then you move to this stage of positioning, presenting, and competing. That's what everybody thinks about as sales, right? Everyone thinks about the process of some person, you know, trying to I mean, a used car sales guy or, a, you know, an irritating telesales person just trying to tell you about their product and why it's the greatest thing in the world. That this positioning, presenting and competing stage 
is what we all think of as sales, but it's really only a part of it. And you should only engage in that stage with a prospect that is highly qualified, that you've validated is likely to buy your product. Then of course, if your customer selects you, I should say if your prospect selects you, because they're not a customer yet, I define a customer as someone who's actually paying you for, for your product. Once they've selected you, then you're gonna be going into this negotiating phase where you're negotiating price and commercial terms and things like that. And when you reach agreement, you close the deal, which is that closing phase. And then you go into the process of implementation or delivery, um, making the customer successful. Why? So that they'll buy more, so that they will expand and ultimately adopt your solution broadly throughout their entire enterprise. This is the baseline sales process. Again, it's gonna be different whether you're talking to a B2B versus a B2C model. It's gonna be different industry by industry and market by market. But in general, these are the steps that you're gonna go through. Any questions here? All right, one other graphic to explain that a little bit. In sales, we talk about this concept of funnel or pipeline. Now, if you imagine this diagram, if I rotated it 90 degrees, it would look more like a funnel. The target bar would be on the top and nice and wide, and it would narrow down to a pipeline, which is really the bottom of the funnel. This is very much of a sales term. And you'll hear the phrase, marketing fills the funnel and sales closes the pipeline. So marketing is responsible for generating the, the leads, the awareness in the market, and getting a bunch of prospects or targets, if you will, to engage with the company. Then sales development takes over to do the qualification of those prospects. And finally, once those prospects are qualified or vetted, and it's clear that they have a need you can solve, and they have the means to actually buy your product, then you start the sales process. But this shows the relationship between the marketing activities, sales development activities, sometimes called business development, but I think more, more to, to the point today, we call it sales development, and then the actual sales or selling. Questions? All right. Okay, the next two slides are actually the sales slides. So, um, we're 50 minutes in, we have 40 minutes left. For all of you that want to learn how to sell, if you only learn one thing out of this presentation, it should be this slide. Because this is, of all the different sales methodologies and sales trainings that I've done over my 20 plus year career, and many of which I've delivered, this one graphic, more than anything else, describes how to sell and what, you know, what is the structure or the framework that you should be thinking in every interaction you have with prospective customers. So spend a little bit of time walking you through this, but apply, apply this one graphic to your business. And frankly, you can apply it to lots of personal situations in your personal life too. And I promise you, you will be more successful getting to the outcome you want of having a prospect become a customer. All right, so here goes. The, the framework here is what I call value-based conversations or a value-based sales process. And at the heart of it is this simple concept that a sale is, is nothing more than a transaction between a buyer and a seller where a buyer has an, a need, a seller has a solution to that need, and both the buyer and the buyer agrees that there's business value in solving their need and therefore should be willing to pay the seller a portion of the business value, you know, in <laughs> when I was in ag tech, right, there's a farmer, there's a saying that farmers use, you know, I got to spend a nickel to save a dime. 
But that's the concept, right? People will spend a poor, if, if people see business value, if I can, if I can earn an additional million dollars in revenue for my company, or if I can save my company a million dollars in expenses and costs, I should be willing to pay some portion of that, whether it's half of that, 500,000, or a tenth of that, 100,000, but I should be willing to spend $100,000 if I can save my company a million dollars. So that's what you're trying to do. In order to get to that discussion, you have to be real clear about what are what, what is the prospect's current situation, what are the challenges that they're facing, the business pains that they're facing today. They might not even know this what, or understand this before you engage with them, but you need to have them understand, and so therefore you've got to understand What's their before scenario? What's the current state? What are the business pains that they are experiencing today? And what are the negative consequences of those business pains? And so this is the light blue boxes up top on the upper left, right? Before you ever talk about your company or your product, you've got to talk to the customer about their business, their business pain, and about what that business pain is costing them today in dollar terms, in wasted resource terms, in um, <clears throat> slowness, in an inability to respond to changes in their market. So they're not agile, they're not, um, they're not able to get their own products to market fast enough, things like that. All of these are business pains that you need to validate that they have and then you need to get their buy-in that if you were able to help them solve those business pains, that there are positive business outcomes to them, right? So again, in the example of if your solution can help save a company a million dollars a year, you have to convince them that, that by buying your solution that that million dollar savings is real, right? Or I'm sorry, not that buying your solution, that solving their problem, because we haven't even talked about your solution yet, but this whole light blue set of boxes up top of the before state and the after state, you've got to do that before you ever talk about your own product. You've got to help them, help your prospect understand they've got a problem, it has negative consequences today. If they solve that problem, there are positive business outcomes. They'll save money, they'll spend less money, they'll earn more money, they'll gain market share, all those different things. Once you've established that, then you can transition to the next, the, the dark blue boxes at the bottom of this slide, which are further diving into, if you were to solve your current business pain and achieve that future state, what are the required capabilities that you need to go from where you are today to where you want to be? And how are you going to measure your progress to make sure that that positive business outcome is real and achievable and that you're doing it? And once you've established all that agreement with the customer, then and only then should you start talking about, well, here's how we, here's how my company can help you on your journey better than any other alternative that you might be considering to solve your business pain. And then let me offer some proof points of how we've done it with other customers. That last, the bottom three dark blue boxes are the quote selling, but, the, but you should only be selling to companies that already agree they've got the problem that you can solve and agree that that problem is worth solving because of the positive business outcomes, okay? Literally, if you take this diagram, this mental structure into every discussion you have and every sales cycle you engage in, I promise you, you will be more successful in getting to the desired outcome of 
convincing a customer to be, or convincing a prospect to buy your product or solution. All right, was there a question or um, chat that came in? Um, there wasn't one sent to the group. All right, I thought I, I saw a flash on my screen. Sorry, I thought it might've been a question. Let me, let me pause though, right? Any questions here? This may not make sense to you guys now, but just go back and refer to this. And I, could I ask a question really quick? Absolutely, Natasha. Going back for the, um, could you go back a slide really quick? Absolutely. The required capabilities, could you just explain that a little bit more? Sure. Um, it's, it's a setup for being able to then come in to, uh, to go to the stage in the conversation where you say, we just established what you need to get from where you are today to where you want to go. It just so happens that our solution has those required capabilities. Okay. So um, let's see, let me, let me come up with, uh, so baseline health, right? Um, as I read the, the prep, uh, their, their platform is a platform for getting, for, for making available an end medical consumer's medical records, right? Um, empowering the, the end customer in the medical process to understand, you know, and have access to all your medical care. So the value-based conversation for uh, a hospital or an insurer that, you know, the baseline health team would be having would talk about, all right, today, yeah, you're delivering healthcare to millions of, of patients, but they don't have access to their own healthcare records and things like that. So what are the negative consequences of that? First of all, the patients themselves struggle to understand where their care is at and you know, what, what's going on with their own healthcare and what do they do? Their only option is to pick up the phone and bother nurses on their care team and bother doctors and make excess appointments. And when they do, there's, you know, the, the, the doctors, the staff of the hospital has to spend a tremendous amount of time just giving them information that in the future state, the kind of the, the desired outcome state, if the patients had access to all of this, they'd be much more satisfied. Their experience as a patient would be um, really positive. Um, you know, they would have the information that today they want but don't need, and they wouldn't be imposing costs on the medical system by calling their providers and asking them information and getting frustrated and frustrating the doctors because every time a doctor has to just give it information like this that could be provided self-service, that doctor is not delivering care to another patient, right? So that's the before and the after scenario. Then you talk about the required capabilities, which is to do this, you have to have a self-service platform that can allow your patients to access their own medical information, but in a manner that's secure because every healthcare provider has to have, um, has to honor HIPAA requirements and privacy concerns and things like that. So you can't just, you, know, you can't just design a platform that isn't secure, that doesn't obey all the regulatory requirements unique to the healthcare industry. Um, you know, you have to have a, a reliable way to populate the information so that when the consumer, the medical cons uh, patient logs on and they know that they have all the information that they want, because of course in the medical world, we know that there's a lot of systems that don't talk to each other. And so maybe the x-rays the archival system for x-rays isn't integrated with this portal that gives the, the patient access to their x-rays as well as to their follow-up appointment notes from their doctor. So these are all the general required capabilities that you, are, that you help the, the prospect to understand before you've ever talked about your platform, right? But just help them to think through how would they solve this problem? And what are the required capabilities? And then how would they even measure that they've solved the problem that you just made them aware that they have? And the art here, the real art 
is in being able to do this in a manner that is solution agnostic, right? Which means the customer, the, 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 the prospect really appreciates you helping them think through what it takes to solve the problem that you've just made them aware that they have and the negative consequences that the, of that problem. And now you walk them through, all right, what does the solution look like? And once you've got them to say, oh yeah, oh, so I get it, right? I just like, I saw you nodding your head when you, when you and I'm just making this off, up off the top of my head, Natasha, but I happen to see your, your image on my screen. But when I said, gave the two examples of, you know, access to the x-ray system and stuff like that, you're like, oh yeah, you know what, you're right. That, that does make sense as that needs to be a component of a solution to this problem. Because if we solve the part of the problem, but didn't give them access to the x-rays, the patients wouldn't be fully satisfied. I've just described all this in general, in industry language terms, without ever once mentioning, we are baseline health and we have a product and we have a platform to do all this. I've just got them to agree of what generically the solution needs to have in it. And once they've nodded their head a couple times, I got them right where I want them, right? This is the selling that says, I've just made you aware that you've got a big problem that has big business value if you solve it. And I've described in general terms what it would take for a, a real solution to that problem. And you're like, okay, tell me. And I'm like, well, it just so happens. I work for a company, Baseline Health, and we've developed a platform that does what we've just described, what we've just agreed is the necessary steps to solve this problem. See how that works? And now, if you have any questions, this little statement, you know, we called this the mantra at one of my companies, is that it's literally the paragraph that you read when you're trying to go from the, the light blue boxes at the top to transitioning to let me tell you about our solution. So I'll just read this out loud. What I hear you saying, Mr. and Ms. Customer, is that these are the positive business outcomes you're trying to achieve. In order to achieve these, we agreed that these are the required capabilities you're gonna need. And you'll probably wanna measure your progress on these required capabilities using the metrics we just discussed. Now, let me tell you how we Baseline Health have solved exactly this problem in, in this manner. And let me tell you how we've done it better than or differently from some of the other competing alternatives that you may be evaluating. And don't take my word for it. Let me show you how some of our early customers um, have demonstrated that we've solved this and that we've delivered this business value. So I've had reps that, sales reps, that literally print this paragraph out, cut the square out, tape it to their computer monitor. And when I hear them in the, phone, uh, in the office, I hear them reading this paragraph in a manner that doesn't sound like they're reading the paragraph. But you know, one, one rep in particular, I loved walking by his desk and listening to him use exactly these words because this was pasted to his monitor. And he got really good results, right? He got really good buy-in for the customer, the prospect on the other end of the line to say, you know what, I've got to hear more. You guys sound like you have a really compelling solution to a problem that I have and I've been wrestling with for a while, but I just hadn't come up with the answer. Absolutely, we'll take an in-person meeting. Bring your best team out and let's go, let's sit down and let's really hear what you have to offer. And let's, you know, show us a demo because you've convinced me in this one conversation that you can solve my problem and that this is worth a lot of money to my company if we can solve it. Okay. All right, let me pause. Literally, if we just ended right now, this is sales and this is how you will be successful. If you guys think in this framework and every interaction you have with customers, if you fit it into this structure here and make sure that you've really established an agreement with the customers that there's a business problem they have and that it's worth solving and that it's worth solving now. Okay, questions? Professor Shao, what do you think? You still on? 
I'm on, and uh, I'm convinced that you've solved my problem. <laughs> See, he's an easy mark. Thank you, Ed. All right, so again, that's what I want you guys to think about. So now let's go a little bit deeper, right? We still have 15 minutes. I'm, I'm gonna rush through the, the rest of the content just to give you more things to think about for how to be successful in having that value-based conversation and getting to the outcome that each one of your startups will need early on when you're trying to land your first customers, all right? We talked about qualification. These are the, this is how I ask my sales teams to qualify accounts. First of all, in that value-based conversation, when you're talking about the current state and the negative business consequences and the future state and the positive business outcomes, you are listening for why would this prospect do anything? I happen to believe people change their behavior based on two basic emotions greed or fear. And I define them as this. The greed motivation to change is if I change my behavior, good things will happen, right? If I take the steps to actually solve the problem that you've just helped me to understand, I will get those positive business outcomes. The fear motivator can actually be more motivating, if you will, Fear I define as if I do not change my behavior, bad things will happen or bad things will continue to happen. So that's that in the previous diagram. If I don't do anything differently, I will continue to have these negative business outcomes that I'm experiencing today and they will become worse. Okay. So that's the purpose of that um, present state, future state conversation. You are looking for this motivation for change. You're looking for either the greed motivator or the fear motivator. If you can't find either, you can talk all day long to this prospect. They are not going to change their behavior. They're not going to be open to buying your solution because you haven't established that they think the problem is significant enough to solve. So if you can't provoke this motivation for change, you should move on and disqualify them. Then next, if you have established that they have either a fear or greed motive for change, then the question is, well, why would they do this now? So what you're looking for is urgency. And urgency comes from either the value, the, you know, the business value of solving this problem is so great that they can't ignore it, or maybe there's some compelling event in their, in their world that, you know, whether it's, I, I got to solve this by the end of the year, or we've got a new product to launch, you know, in April of next year. And if we don't have these problems solved, our product launch will go wrong. Whatever it is, you're looking for a reason why they would change their behavior in the near term. And if they don't, if maybe they acknowledge they have a problem, but they're just not ready to solve it now, you should also disqualify them, which means you should set them aside. You should not keep calling them. You should not waste your time trying to take them out to lunch or dinner. You should then just nurture them by continuing to send them information, keeping in touch with them, but putting them on the back burner until they have both motivation for change and urgency. And so keep this whole process of nurturing just means keeping in touch, informing them what your company is doing, and sooner or later, they will reach a level of urgency that makes sense for you to engage in an actual sales uh, cycle with them. And then finally, after you've established both motivation for change and urgency to do it now, that's when you go through or you engage them in the actual selling process, which is why would they use your solution, right? So here's where you confirm the fit of your solution to their specific pains and needs. And it may be that your product just doesn't solve the problem in the way they need it, or doesn't work the way their process works or something like that. You know, when you get to those outcomes, then you disqualify until either their needs change or your solution changes to meet their existing needs, all right? When we talk about that qualification step, step these three questions, 
three reasons to disqualify are super important. And you gotta be objective about them and you gotta be testing this constantly. Questions? All right, the simple takeaway from this slide, in the sales, whenever you're engaging with prospects or customers, you gotta prepare for every single interaction. And I mean every, I can't tell you how many sales reps I've managed that wanna rely on what they think is their God-given talent for relating to people and you know, being so good and so likable that they don't have to prepare for meetings, that they don't have to put in the effort to anticipate well, to, to think about what is the desired outcome of the meeting, to anticipate the objections that customers might be raising and to know how to handle them. You know, all these other detailed things that really good salespeople do, there's a lot of sales reps that don't do them. And those people are less successful and they frustrate the hell out of sales management and company management. So. I have to drill this into it's a surprising number of people with a lot of experience that don't understand the importance of preparation here. Okay. So for you guys, since you've never, most of you have never sold before, this will be really important. Always know with every interaction, whether it's an email or a phone call, even what's the desired outcome? Why, you know, what do you want as the next step in your sales engagement process with this prospect or with this customer? Know that before you send the email, what is the call to action that you want them to do? Or know that before you pick up the phone and call them or before you, if you've got a meeting scheduled, what are the outcomes that you are, are focused on for that meeting? If you wanna get them to the next step of, yep, I agree, let's go start a proof of concept, great. But you gotta talk about that as a team beforehand and then script your whole meeting to accomplish the outcome or write your email in the way that's most effective to accomplish the outcome of the email that you want, okay? It's a pretty basic concept, but you'd be surprised how many salespeople don't invest the time and effort to, to prepare. And this will be important for you guys too. Questions on this? I think it's obvious, right? All right, objection handling. I'm just gonna build this out. Um, this is something you guys can read afterwards. There's a little bit more important content that I want to dwell on. But just know that in every, especially in every meeting or in every sales cycle, customers will raise objections. Those objections might be something that they thought of. Those objections might be ideas that a competitor put in their head about your solution because the competitor has set a trap for you. Whatever it is, there is gonna be objections. And so you've got to treat objection handling. This is a whole you know, two days training class on objection handling that I've been through, summarized in one slide of a couple of bullets, but really important. First of all, you have to seek out objections proactively because I guarantee you customers are thinking them and you can't address those objections if you don't pull them out of the customers or the prospects, all right? Who buys something, who spends a million dollars on a product and doesn't ask a single challenging question? Nobody. So you gotta know that those objections are there. And if you haven't in your discovery process pulled the objection out of your customer or prospect, then they're walking out of the room with the same doubts that they had coming in and you didn't do your job in pulling those doubts out so that you can address them. Once you've got them on the table, step into the objection. Don't be fearful of it. Literally in presentation skills classes, they teach you when you're up in front of a room, someone asks a question, you do something as simple as take a step forward because that, because it, many people will literally with their body language, take a step backward that shows that they're fearful of the objection. And you know, simple little things, but you're taught to step forward when you ask a question so that it shows the customer, not only are you not afraid, you welcome their objection and you want to address it genuinely with them. You know, then understand why they're asking that question. What's the business value behind the objection? 
make sure that you know that that's an important objection. Sometimes it'll be a red herring or something, especially if it's a competitor trap, someone else has set, you know, it might be a distraction, but you gotta make sure that you, rec you establish that, what, that the thing they're asking about really is important and then address it. Either do it in the moment, take it as a follow-up, but you gotta make sure you address it because if you leave it unaddressed, that, that person and everyone else in the room will say, huh, they didn't have a good answer for the question that we raised. They must be afraid or their product must not do what we asked about or whatever it is. And then finally confirm you answered it, right? Hopefully this makes sense. It's just a skill, it's a sales skill, but one that um, you actually have to learn and practice with intention, okay? All right, I'm gonna just go through, let me pull up on my other pad, to see how many more slides I have, because we haven't had as many questions yet. Uh, I wanna make sure that we save time for questions. Um, Stephanie, Gina, anything else in the chat before I keep going? Uh, not so far, sorry. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, so if anyone's got questions, jump in, don't be shy. All right, so look, I'm, th these additional um, keys are things that I'll let you guys read on your own. They may or may not make sense because some of them are kind of advanced, but this is these are, after you've had a couple of years of selling, you'll start to recognize patterns, unexpected things that happen, and you'll learn to anticipate those. And then once you start anticipating those, you can respond in a very strategic manner and in a very prepared manner. So I'm gonna jump over that. Um, yeah, God, I, I love to talk through these things, but I, uh, we don't have enough time right now and they may be a little bit advanced. Um, you will see in these notes, uh, things like, you know, again, preparation means you can execute flawlessly on things within your control because there's gonna be a lot of things about selling that are not in your control. And you gotta save your, uh, you know, save, um, save your skills for responding to stuff that you can't anticipate. There's so many pro things that will come up that make selling difficult. You should never make mistakes on the stuff that's within your control. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of negotiation strategy in here that, that again might be a little bit advanced, but read these afterwards and feel free to reach out to me. The thing I wanna get to, oh, yeah, you know what? Last bullet point here, honesty, integrity, never sacrifice the moral high ground. I will tell you, um, lots of people have a perception of sales as this slimy profession where people will say anything and do anything just to separate you from your money. And that's not sales, right? People who sell like that, I can beat them eight or nine times out of 10, right? So not only should you make sure that you are, you know, super high integrity in all your sales cycles, but I promise you that customers will also do the same things. Buyers will lie to you. They will mislead you. They will do things that you consider to be low integrity. And you got to save the moral high ground for being able to call them out and call BS when they do things that you don't, that, that are not okay. I will say, you know, the, the bullet point up uh, one above, push back, say no, test your leverage in a deal. You must walk away at least once in every negotiation. That happens to be one of my secret sauces. I developed, I, I discovered that early on in some really high stakes sales cycles in my career when I realized you know, the table was, the deck was stacked against me. You know, there was some unscrupulous stuff going on. And so I either did walk away from the deal or I threatened to walk away from the deal. And I was amazed that suddenly I had newfound power because I realized the customer actually needed me to be in the deal because they needed to be able to say at the end of the sales cycle why they chose the competitor. There had to be some sort of an evaluation between two companies. And so suddenly I was able to negotiate much a, a level playing field 
and allowed our, our team to be pulled back into a deal. I could never get away with stuff like that if I didn't have the moral high ground, you know, and if I hadn't run a very high integrity sales cycle or our, with our team. And so if you do, if you maintain that honesty and integrity, you will find it gives you a lot of negotiation leverage that then you can use very wisely at those critical points in a deal, especially in the negotiation. Like I say, these are just words to you guys now. You have to experience this to really understand the power of this concept. But when you do, when you walk away from your first deal and you get pulled back in, in by the customer, you will realize that you have some leverage now and you got to go use it and work with it wisely. This is the strategy of selling that is, for me, the most enjoyable and the most, you know, this is where I satisfy my competitive juices. I'm no longer a, you know, a competitive college athlete, but this is where I'm most competitive. And it's really exciting when you get to experience you know, winning a competitive sales deal and doing so by having a superior negotiation strategy. Uh, Todd, there is a question that came in as well. Sure. Uh, so would you say that these points are more general or particularly, particularly relevant to young entrepreneurs? Um, I think there's an added sense of pressure for people like us who are oftentimes much younger than what others will expect and also come from backgrounds that aren't usually seen in the startup world. Do you have any advice for that? Uh, absolutely. So look, when I got into sales, I had the opposite problem. I was older than all the guys I was competing with, right? Um, you know, I spent 10 years in manufacturing and then accidentally found myself in sales. And I realized that I was competing with a lot of other salespeople that you know, had five, 10 years of experience doing this stuff. And so I had to get better faster. I, I couldn't afford to make the same mistake two or three or four times. I had to learn from every mistake I made in every sales situation and then recognize that pattern the next time I came up with it. So in a certain sense, I had the same challenge that you guys do. I had to I had to learn, I had to improve my game, I had to become better at my profession of sales faster than everybody around me. That's kind of the same question you're asking, right? You guys are young, you don't have business experience yet, but the quicker, the, the, the more you apply yourself to learning and to developing your own business experience and developing your own sales intuition, the quicker you can close that gap that you just described of expectations. And then you'll start to have the opposite effect. You'll start to actually surprise people when they expect less, less business experience and less savvy from you because they've sized you up as a young and experienced entrepreneur. And suddenly you demonstrate that you're actually much more than that. So if you can take some of these lessons to heart, think about them, find ways to practice them, you will actually close the gap that you just said. And that's where you'll find that they're even more relevant than you ever realized. Is that a fair response? I'll take silences, yes. I always do, that's a presumptive close. We just gotta thank you, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so look, I also have, this is one of my favorite slides to talk about for a long time, how to hire, what are the talents that I'm looking for when I hire salespeople, all right? I'd love to go through this, but I wanna to get to my last summary slide because we got three or four minutes left. So take this, read it, think about it afterwards, and think about modeling these skills and attributes for yourself. And then when you get to the point in your entrepreneurial ventures where you start to hire salespeople, feel free to just use these questions and understand, you know, think about why they're important and what are the underlying things that you're looking for when you're trying to hire that first salesperson in your company, because that is such an important hire. You think it's important to hire all your engineers and stuff? That is important. Hiring your first salesperson is also really important. It's not just hiring some knucklehead who's got an outgoing personality and who's really good on the phone, that, you know, that is such a misguided perception and yet a lot of people think that that's what sales is, okay? All right, let's wrap it up here by talking about what good looks like. And hopefully this has all come across, so this will be a reminder, but 
my own view of sales is it's absolutely very strategic. The biggest compliment I ever got from one of my bosses is that Todd plays chess when everyone else around him is playing checkers. If you do that, you will win far more of your share of deals, right? Back to the value-based conversation, if you're really clear about focusing on your customer's needs and how your solution can satisfy them in every single interaction, you will be more successful. You'll also be better at qualifying out, which means recognizing when you can't focus your customer's needs or recognizing when they can't or won't actually buy from you no matter how much effort you put into selling to them. It'll make you better. And by the way, this is a life skill too. So practice it in your personal life. Every conversation, when you want something, don't just focus on what you want. You generally want something from someone else, whether it's their help or their support or whatever. Figure out why they would do that for you and make sure you appeal to their value, even in personal conversations. And when you guys become parents, I guarantee you this will be a skill you'll appreciate. <laughs> Um, we've talked about delivering value and exceeding expe expectations. Always have a plan. Don't wing anything. Preparation is so important. Um, execute flawlessly on the things within your control and be audible ready. This is where the, present, the, the preparation pays off to respond to things that happen outside of your control because I guarantee you they will. And you know, finally, seek out feedback constructive criticism from your customers, ask them why they didn't buy from you and be open to what they say. And if you do all these things, you'll actually have much more success in sales than you ever thought. And you might even like it and decide to do it as a career. That would be the best, that would be the most rewarding outcome for me is if somehow you guys over time got really good at sales and said, you know what, I wanna do this for a living because it really is a great career. But it's super important for you guys in your entrepreneurial ventures as well. All right, with that, we're done and I'm only one minute over. How about it? There's one more question that came in. I know we wanna wrap up soon, but we wanna just get, get to this one. Um, so how do you know when you should move to phase two, uh, meaning moving to higher sales talent? Well, the, the short answer is when you as the founders are finding yourselves so consumed with sales that you're not doing the rest of your job of leading your company and raising funds. And when you're starting to see the momentum in, the con in, the, um, in your acquisition of customers and this repeatability where it's like, okay, I, I as the founder have debugged the sales process and the buying process for our target market. We've got product market fit. I can teach someone else to do this who isn't the expert that I have become. And my time is more valuably spent not picking up the phone every day, but letting someone else pick up the phone every day work on getting sales cycles down to the point where they need to talk to someone with deep expertise and then that person would call me in. So it's really about your own time and where your, where your time and value is most important to your company as well as how repeatable your sales process is for that first sales hire. You should be trying to get to that point as quickly as possible, however. This is not something you should be postponing. You should be accelerating towards getting it to the point where you can get one or more people doing the selling and focus full time on that. If you can do that, you're doing everything right as a leader. Hey, any other questions from anyone else? I have a comment. Um, this was about sales, but it's really about life. Take every one of those guidelines and apply it to life, doing things for others that are valuable for them, listening to their needs and being able to satisfy. Integrity and honesty, the moral high ground. These are life lessons. And I wanna thank you, Todd, for those life lessons. You could have taught me, but thank you for, uh, for the compliment, Ed. By the way, you guys should know that 
you know, Professor Shao's class was the class of 61. So that was, I think the technical term is our, our parent class, right? The 25th reunion class that leads the period when we, the graduated class, graduate. So I already have a special bond with Professor Shao and his son, Ed Shao Jr., is one of my closest friends from my class. So I've learned some life lessons from, from Ed, even though um, he may not realize that. Thank you. That means a lot. And uh, I'm also a member, honorary member of the class of 11, which is the, the uh, what, you're the parent class to the class yeah, of exactly. 11. <laughs> so uh, there's a, an even broader bond. There we go. So I'll meet with uh, all of you uh, on Friday and uh, listen to your uh, updates, what you've learned so far, current status and what your plans are for the next four or five weeks.